Are we live? I can't wait. <gasps> wait, 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 wait. Yay! Okay, we're live. Hello, 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 Facebook scrollers. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, if you're just scrolling through looking for something to do, feel free to stop by because in just a few minutes, we're going to have an interview with the fabulous Jess the Ska Kid. And you're not going to want to miss this. It's going to be a good time. Um, all right, let me just make sure that everything is tagged. Everything is ready to go here. And I believe it is. I believe it is ready to go. Um, I'm just going to share it real quick. And then, Dan, uh, if you want to yeah. do the intro to the show. I guess. <laughs> I guess. Do something to something that effect. Like that. Okay. All right. There we go. And boom. All right. Let's do this thing. So, <clears throat> Oh, good evening, everybody. It is Sunday, August 16th. I'm Adela. Mm, I'm Dan. And you're listening to the Underbelly Hours. Cue the live music that will happen if you listen to the podcast version of this episode. So as a friendly reminder for people scrolling through their timelines, this is the live recording of the podcast tonight. If you want to see the fully edited, nice and special slamdy dandy version, um, you can check out streaming platforms starting tomorrow when this podcast will be available. So yes, and welcome on the show for the very first time, even though we've been trying to like get this for at least I think a year now. Um, just the Scott kid and um, yeah, how, how you guys doing this fabulous warm summer evening? <laughs> We're alive and well, thanks for having us. It has been about a year. <laughs> Yeah, right. I just feel like each time it's been like, oh, I'm going to be able to maybe go up and, and like live record from your place. And, and then I asked you to come here and it's just it's a crazy time. But I'm so glad that we can finally talk to you guys because you have such a cool wealth of information about, you know, just local bands in the Wisconsin and also Illinois area. And you've been doing your show for like now you said three years, right? So it's, it's been, it's been a while, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, some of our listeners who are tuned in right now don't really know about just the Scala kids. So if you had to basically explain the premise of the show to them, what would you, what would you say? We're an underground non-genre specific platform that allows for anybody to come and showcase their musicianship and their artistry. Um, really giving the rights, royalties, and educating folks on how to really market themselves as such back to the people. Um, Ta-da! <laughs> are you guys still literally underground? We are literally yes. underground. Our show is done from our basement. Um, it, when we bought our house, that was one of the things. We were like, we have to have a basement. So <laughs> we will continue to, to do this until we can't do it no more. Beautiful. It's fabulous. It's also like a great catch line, right? Yeah, music, underground music that's literally underground. I love it so yeah. much. Um, I guess we can use the same thing whenever we go back into the studio. Yeah, but we're, like... kind of underground. Yeah, Our antenna is not, though. It's not the same, though, you know? Like, initially, I guess, and I'll let you guys maybe explain how this whole thing started, but I, I know of Just the Scott Kid because um, I was in a, a duo for a little bit that actually recorded at Just the Scott Kid's um, basement, but the first basement that was underground. Yep. And I just wanted to say, I think, I know that you you guys were talking about the fact that you now have a new basement and it's refinished and stuff, but um, man, I just think there's a certain type of fun, like super DIY aesthetic when you go to like an unfinished basement, but like it has this huge, cool banner of just a Scott kid and like super friendly conversations, super friendly people. Um, and it's just, it, it was a great, it was a great time. I really, really enjoyed it. So um, just wanted to say that real quick before we also <laughs> keep going. Um, but it's, you know, underground music is such a niche kind of thing to get into. Uh, how did your guys' journey 
of underground music begin? When did you decide to get into it? Okay. Do you want our personal stories as to how we got into underground yeah. music? Mm-hmm. Touch on the, the very, like just you. Okay. So how this show started was I was a radio DJ back when I went to Parkside uh, from 2005 until 2009. I worked my way up and was the station manager. I built basically a new station there and um, had left in 2014. Fast forward to like a professional setting. I was helping um, a local nonprofit who was going to throw a benefit show. Um, and it was a fundraiser for what they were trying to start. I was happy happened to be next to him at another event where they're talking about it. And I was like, Oh, and he's like, yeah, you know, it's a, a big budget or like, it's going to cost us a lot of money. We don't have that much money. I said, here's how you can do this. And I hooked him up with the station. So I went and sat there for that meeting and they said, what do you, why are you here? And I was like, well, I'm here to help them. Plus I want my show back. So I started doing a show and I did that until 2017. And uh, at that time, the e-board had changed. New management wanted me gone. And they, um, but they didn't want me gone. They were just really pissed off, I guess, at some of the things like that had, had been allowed. I was bringing in live bands there. I was making- That's the best part of a radio station is when you have I, live bands. Um, they wanted to go a different direction. And it's funny, they ended up really breaking their whole constitution. Those kids uh, got in trouble and they got kicked out of Parkside. Um, but I left there and said, I was really mad. We went home, I sat on the porch, I drank a beer, I smoked a clove and I was like, I've been doing this anyway. So let's just do it. So that first night we spun records and we had about 500, I think, people watch yeah. us. And I was like, what? This is dumb. <laughs> so after two weeks of that, we said, why not just invite people to come play in our basement? And from then on, we had every Thursday booked. And at one point when we started, we were doing Tuesday, Thursday, Friday shows, and then weekend shows where we would book and promote in the community. So... We've dialed it back. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. First using like really crappy uh, phone data. So <laughs> I'm surprised so many people still watched it. And then we were tethering from someone else's <laughs> phone. Until, you know, a year after that, we actually finally got like internet. So In 2018, yeah. we splurged and decided we wanted to be slightly more professional. <laughs> um, but it is, it is completely underground and our roots are underground. Like Kip and I both have been in our local scene um, since, well, I was 14, but he was like eight. Oh, yes. So. Dang. So, so what did you guys do before the whole radio show, podcast or internet show, I guess? It's like a whole variety show that you guys do. But uh, before you, this, what, what, what were you guys, how did you get involved in, in the scene? Were you musicians in the scene? So Kiff is a musician and I, I can't, I am a musician. I play clarinet and saxophone, um, but Kiff really has been in, in it, in multiple bands doing that thing. I just went to shows. And then when I got into college, like I started interviewing bands and um, the college radio station allowed me to like get tickets to go to shows. And I wasn't even like, e doing anything within my own scene. It was like, there's a show in Milwaukee. I don't even know who's playing, but I can get a press pass, so I'm gonna go do that, um, so. Yeah, I've been in bands since uh, the fifth grade, always drawing my own flyers, you know, photocopying them, and getting drunk in the alleys, so there you go. In the fifth grade? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Not till I was there. For any of them ska bands, Never been in a ska band. What? I know, right? Never been in a ska band. Um, Do you like ska though? Like, yeah. Where's the ska come from? Okay. So 
this is the funny thing. I am the ska kid who is non-genre specific because I love ska and how I got my name. I was about 14. I had started doing uh, this local um, teen task force, which was a volunteer group of kids that like kept kids off drugs and helped their local community. And we did a haunted house every year. And the really scary metalheads that really predominantly managed and ran this thing um, were setting up and building props. And I show up one day and I recognized a neighborhood kid and was like, hi, Ryan. Do, 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 do. And he's like, oh, that's Jess. She likes ska. And like everybody's playing like, I don't even know, death metal and black metal. And I was like, that's okay, I'm happy. But I became friends with them and they kind of just dubbed me, that's just the ska kid. And so I, that, it stuck, the metal heads named me as such and therefore my name was given. <laughs> so, but I, I do love ska. And I believe firmly in the whole like identity of what that means which is unity, which is progression, which is inclusiveness, um, which is why our show doesn't have any sort of um, genre specified. Every single walk of life is allowed to come play in our basement because it's not up to me to regulate, I don't believe, on um, what is art, music, and what people will like. Yeah, that's that's very ska of you. <laughs> I love it. No, <laughs> when also... show... The person oh, she yes, came with had I no clue what ska was. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Yeah. You can, can watch that. It's from January 18th, I believe, uh, intrinsic, or maybe 28th. Extrinsic. It, it, I can't say it. Extrinsic? Extrinsic. There you go. Extrinsic. Oh, oh yeah. Alex. Uh, oh, was it me who didn't know what ska was? I thought I knew what ska was at the time. Oh, Alex. Oh, it was Alex. Alex. Was like, yeah. I don't have any <laughs> Yeah, he's a he's a he's a sweet guy. Shout out to Alex. Uh, yeah, but he had no clue. It was really funny. Um, yeah, it was extrinsic. That was a fun. That was a fun show. Um, kind of circling back for a second, though, just you know, to your progression of, you know, you started in your basement, and you had such a like influx of bands coming in. You said you guys were doing shows Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then some weekends too. Um, why do you think? there was such a demand for musicians like why do you think they were drawn so much to to your shows that you had like demands out the out the window essentially of of interviewers and, and live shows that's a good question i think probably because we hit on a lot of things that people want where we don't have a genre specified we're not the FCC, so you're allowed to perform the way you want to perform, which means, and we have had people get almost naked, smash things, break things, scream, yell. Um, you know, we're not, we don't have to censor anything. Um, we, I think, just seem so unique that people have been drawn to that sort of like, she knows what she's talking about. She's all over the place. I'm just gonna reach out. And we've gotten referrals, which is how that's supposed to kind of work. Um, and I would say a majority of the people who have come through our basement aren't from Kenosha, Wisconsin, or like they're not from this area. We I mean, also uh, along with that, uh, because of how dead this town is on certain days of the week, we offered, hey, just come to our house. Mm -hmm. We're open. That's interesting. So you mentioned, at, you know, it started in Kenosha. That's why you guys are based. But you have had acts from all over the place um, due to just word of mouth, which is great. Um, is there any memorable performances that really stick out to you to this day? There's a lot of those. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But like maybe like the one of the one top. Pretty close yeah, to one of the top favorites. The most memorable. <laughs> I have a few we're going to touch on. Flip in the combined effort from Denton, Texas, who showed up. They fit a giant eight-piece ska band in the basement, and they had people sitting, like, kind of on each other. So full of energy. They danced. They moved. They were great. Then we had Hans Gruber and the Die Hards, again, another Texas band. Phenomenal. They just, their energy was amazing. Um, Billy Dreamer from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who we 
from this show now are their host uh, for Milwaukee Punk Fest. Josh is insane. That band is great. Um, those would probably be my tops. Also, uh, one of uh, one of the original Chicago uh, punk rock bands. Oh, yeah. Tutu and the Pirates. That was one of my favorites. What was it? What are they called? Tutu and the Pirates? Pirates. Yeah, so they're uh, a historic, like, they helped form the Chicago punk rock scene. Um, and these are just and some of them also broke off into the ska scene. So it was really neat getting to see, like they had friends show up that night and I was like, oh, you're from Scapone and like you've played and toured all over with like the toasters. And so it's been really neat um, kind of connecting with the bigger ska bands. Like we just had Adam Flymo Birch on the show um, with Lenville Golding from the specials. They called us and wanted to do this. So that's really cool. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> My microphone was off. That's fantastic, man. Um, and then I guess since you have done this show a lot in, in Kenosha and you've just both grown up in your local scene, um, diverging for a second from the show, I, I got a little bit curious when you mentioned, you know, you said that the town is kind of dead on some weekdays um, as far as like entertainment options and stuff. Um, what are some, I guess, maybe one of the, the more popular genres in your scene? And in, in, in by your scene, <laughs> I'm not sure if, huh? That's not even a genre. Cover bands, did you say? Karaoke nights. Just kidding. Karaoke so, <laughs> the, I Our town is predominantly punk. And it... When we say, like, not only is it dying off in some, like, on some nights, it's just kind of dying because it is, like, the people that started this scene, they're the same old guys that have been kind of doing this. And as life has gone on, there hasn't been, like, a resurgence. When we got involved, there was a resurgence of youth within the scene. Um, and that's when ska became really prevalent with the punk scene in Kenosha. And so from, I would say the late nineties into early to mid two thousands, you had a good mix of ska punk. Um, but then those kids that were in ska bands grew up and went to college and it was just the punk kids left. So those same people are just doing it. So until, and unless we have new little ones like join the scene, um, we'll start to see maybe just a continued like stagnant sort of um, music scene. We have to have young people join our scene and we have to stop being so like uh, restrictive and um, pretentious in music scenes. That whole stuff needs to stop because um, you can't call a little kid a poser. Why don't we call them a learner? Like we want them to learn what this is, why we hold these traditions, why this music is, why it is, so that it can continue. It's like cutting off your nose to spite your face. If you don't let any new blood in, you're just gonna die. That tree withers and it is gone, so. Is there any, um, I know that this is a problem in the Chicago suburban scene a lot is um, maybe a little bit less of the like pretentious, like older people looking down, but definitely, there's a lot of competition for venues because unless you go right into Chicago, the, sub the suburbs are still kind of like lackluster in venues. And so you get a lot of, um, you know, showcases of five bands where the bands don't show up and support each other that much. Is that something also that happens around your guys' scene or maybe a little less so? We have a limited amount of venues, but I do have to say, and, and one other aspect of what we do is if you book with us, we have rules. And like, I really hold people to those rules about liking, sharing, following. Um, you know, they have to like each other's stuff. They have to share each other's stuff. They all have to be there at the same time so that the whole show happens and they're there. They're not allowed to leave early or they don't get paid. Um, so I've, I, all of those problems that you do see other places, we've tried to um, kind of nix 
because it is such a problem. You don't want the main headlining band to show up 20 minutes before and think they're such hot stuff that they don't have to support anyone because it's really your influence and your existence being there that helps draw in the crowd. Um, I would say that for the most part, we're good. Like the scene is pretty supportive here because it's all the same people. <laughs> and that's a, that's a fair point. Yeah. And, and they're going to the same things. I mean, you do have some arguments of some of the older people who have now year after year been like, that guy doesn't show up to anything. That guy doesn't show up to anything. I'm like, then don't invite him and like move on. Like don't book them then. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like we here have a better supportive community because those people who are making the music are all the same humans going to the same places. Fair. And, and yeah. forever. Mm -hmm. Well, I love, though, the fact that you guys are holding your performers to those rules. I think, you know, so much can be alleviated if booking agents, when they're booking a show, really do make sure to hold people to just some basic, like, courtesy rules, you know, that are important to to keeping the scene alive and, and growing and expanding, you know. I mean, I think that's why, at least around here in Chicago, and I think... Um, that's kind of why like the hip hop scene is a little more tight than the rock scene because the rock scene still has that like pretentiousness kind of, oh, I'll only show up to my five minutes and then I'll scoot, you know, kind of an attitude. Um, but you did mention booking and that's not something we've talked about yet in the interview. How did you guys, or when, I guess, did you guys start to also book shows as Just a Scott Kid? We started booking shows, well, as... Scott Cord Productions in 2016, was it? It was shortly it was, after. I think it was 16. It was shortly after we started dating, which was in 2015. And I think early 2016 is when we were like, hey, because at that point we were getting people all from, again, all over the United States that wanted to come play at Parkside. So I was booked all the time there. Um, and so I was like, why don't we, cause we're getting odd requests. Like, hey, do you know anybody who can record, mix, master? Um, who does promotion, who do? So we became this one stop shop. And I was like, let's just start this and try to make it a business so that we do the radio show, but we also have done this network where you want to book with us, here's what we'll do. And so when a band books with us, we do all of the promotion, the marketing, um, from establishing and obtaining the venue, uh, doing the sound, making sure it's recorded, um, Kif does all of the artwork for our flyers, then we post our flyers all over and I market that all, all over the place. Um, I do ask the bands to share the event and invite people to it, um, but that's the only thing they have to do on their end uh, besides show up and play the show. Uh, but we started, yeah, I think in 16. And then we kind of just, Scott Cord Productions is still on Facebook. But it, Just the Scott Kid became so big that I was like, screw that name. The brand now is Just the Scott Kid because, I mean, from merch to, we now book shows all over the U.S. So Hey, uh, that's so cool. Congrats, guys. I didn't know that. Yeah, we've been able to book a New York band called Castle Black throughout their entire tour of the Midwest. Um, we've helped Hans Gruber do the same. Who else have we helped? I mean, we've helped uh, a couple of things. Radio Hate. Radio Hate. Um, oh, geez. It's the, the Kenosha <laughs> Band got, uh, made it to Mexicali. Oh, yeah, that's right. Dropping Daisies. I forgot we helped them there. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just become a big thing where it just, it, if you message our page and you're like, I need this, this, and this, I'm like, okay, here you go. You guys are also incorporated into that because when bands come on to our show, we tell them about how to market themselves and how to like reach out. And so we have a list of people, your show hey, included, they, get, they can also utilize that. Yeah, so, I do the yes, same thing for you guys. You're also on our list of shows to look up so that's that's awesome thanks for the thanks for the love um 
Wow, that's so cool, though. So did you have like yeah. all these established connections from bands that came on the show for when you went to then start helping with booking all over the states? Or was it just bands would come to you and then you're like, all right, well, let's figure this out. Who can we uh, find out, you know, who to contact to get them booked? <laughs> Uh, B, uh, which is a number two. No, the second part. So um, in my professional life, I have to find resources. So I work in human services and I've held various positions where clients need multiple things to become successful. And so I've learned how to internet really, really good research. And I don't like being told no. And so I will make sure that things work period because I like all the barriers and roadblocks that not only come within human services present themselves in the music community and so I you know just decided I'm gonna figure this out I'm gonna make them not have to stress and worry about things and it's really not hard to read figure things out and then be able to provide people information usually broken down in such a way that it's a conversation so it's like nope we had a band out of the blue from Indiana who was paying a promoter um, called us because, and I quote, you guys know stuff about this. Oh, yes. And they were asking how their label had dropped them and how they could obtain their music. And I was like, you can't because you paid them to take it from you. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I don't know. Out of the blue, if someone messages us and needs something, I will figure it out awesome do you like do the, do you get a cut then um or is this all just like from the kindness of your heart this is all free we um so we everything that we've offered online has been free we've gotten paid to do punk fest as the hosts of that show and now um we had a local business which is a venue now who uses us to book for them um reach out to us to hire us for that so now just the Scott kid Sunday night matinee or review or whatever the hell they call it yeah. is music, music review is a uh, Sunday nights at Union Park Tavern. Um, not this year because COVID. No, 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 there hasn't been any bands uh, since March. We got to do one March. show. Yes. The 13th then, of March. No one wants to adhere to the rules and you know, they don't want to sing or play in a mask. Hasn't happened. Yeah. So how have you guys been faring during this like whole COVID quarantine thing? Because I know each, I mean, you know, we, we've been asking bands this a lot and each person has a slightly different response. So how has it been um, like for you guys? Uh, really good. Um, I don't know if you can hear, minus the children crying. No. <laughs> um, we... We've done well. It was hard because we went from, you know, one a one parent basically household during the day where he was home and ran kids around to school and such to now everyone is home. We're all in the same kind of space trying to do school, do work, you know, all of that um, practice. He just started band practice again uh, about what, a month ago. So, um, so far, we're good. I mean, we have a garden. We have a very pleasant space to exist. I feel like the fate smiled upon us. Uh, our show didn't stop because it's been utilizing this platform since Jump Street. So we have people call in on Thursday night. We interview folks. We play their music or they play live from where they are located. And really, minus setting shows up outside of our house nothing and, and having people here nothing has changed for us i kind of like it <laughs> i miss people coming to my house to play but um i kind of like it we're not as insanely busy as we were it's easier to play music um that's submitted to us i think yeah. as opposed to try to organize okay how many people are coming and they're bringing who with them and um, you know, making sure that all of the children are in bed and the house is secure and, you know, all of that sort of thing. I miss it, but I do also and have enjoyed uh, that we've been able to continue on. 
what have you found to be the most effective method of continuing on the show now that people can't uh, come over to your house? What? I missed it. It broke up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, this is what a bad, I'm using a different laptop than I normally use and it's not really great because mine sucks. Um, but what, so for those of people who haven't checked out Just the Scott Kid yet, what has some of your experiments been, I guess, as COVID quarantine stuff happened? And what do you find to be the most useful alternative to having people at your actual house um, just the most useful way of continuing Jess, the Scott kid. So, um, yeah, our phone interviews have become, I would say primary now, and maybe that's because people are interested in hearing what someone has to say. Um, which is odd because I feel like it was more engaging when there was a table full of ridiculous, but, um, or people sitting around and, you know, our folding chairs were so highly professional here. Um, but we plug, you know, it's, it's phone call based. So they call, we plug in. Um, I don't have a fancy laptop, so I can't do zoom and we've not had any face to face. It's us talking to a phone the, we have them plugged in through our board, just like at a regular radio station, it goes through and broad like is audible through the PA. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. If the band is tech savvy or the person that's doing it feels comfortable because every week we set up an event page they can go through the event page live and play if they would like as opposed to us playing music so we've been able to have that opportunity uh we did set up we did a union park uh live event um as like a test run to see if that would be profitable for them where we did like our normal show, but everybody did it from their own location. Um, so we like popped on, did our little announcement, and then we had it scheduled where each group did their own thing at each time. And while they were playing, we were sharing it all over. So that was pretty neat. And those things can be utilized. I feel like they're being kind of underutilized, except uh, Supernova, Scott Fest has been doing that. Um, Cooley Ranks is the host. He's been able to interview a whole, like, the whole list of people I think that were supposed to play that festival and the weekend that that festival was supposed to exist, they just went live and they had bands submit a like new video or song or little like word sound bite and they played through. So it was like a 12 hour zoom live music fest, which was really neat. Cool. 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 Um, man, it's really interesting to hear you guys talk because it's it's fun to see how just from this one idea of a radio show, you've developed this like pretty much helping bands brand, you know, where you guys expand to doing tours, expand to doing, you know, interviews and, and live shows and everything. Um, yes. Ian Leith also just commented to that saying, y'all are heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Love Ian. Ian's the best. Um, I had one more question and now I can't for the life of me remember did I derail you? Say. Yeah, maybe. Technically, yeah, Ian de derailed you. <laughs> no, Ian could never. <laughs> Ian's the best. Did you have a question real quick while I try to hop on my uh, train of thought? Well, you were talking about how they have branched out to become a multifaceted uh, branding mecca awesomeness. After yeah. that, I don't know where you were going. Uh... All right. Well, I don't remember where I was going with that, but right, I, do I have remember. a super important question. Yeah, Dan, uh, go we'll for it. We'll just do a quick little digression here. What's your favorite ska band? What's my what? Favorite ska band. That's a hard question. I know. Uh, which wave? <laughs> it might be impossible. Uh, let's go second wave. Ooh. Oh. It's a toss up between the specials and the selector. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, the right answer. <laughs> I mean, because those, like, we got to see Rhoda Dakar um, in Chicago last summer. And you want to talk about inspirational women within a genre. Like, women in music are always kind of um, 
either they're over glorified and they don't have talent. They're just kind of being sought after as being that woman icon thing. Um, or, or in a music scene, they're just considered a stupid groupie. And so for women to enter into and be a front lady and still be so important um, in the grassroots areas of like say ska and the message that that is and the advocacy that comes along with the rest of that. Like what we're doing is advocacy for the music community. We believe that the corporate, corporate like horrible big brother that has become all of the labels and all of the third party people that take musicians money and take their art are they're evil and we all should believe that we can take that back and that it can be run by the people for the people because you're out there making the music you're doing the legwork you're running that you wouldn't pay say um you know to, to give other things away that carpenter who builds that house doesn't go to that house and have to pay them so that they can be there to give them the estimate to build whatever it is they're building. Music has is one of the only areas, I think, where it's been flipped, where you have everybody paying everybody else and the return is so small that it doesn't make sense that if we all agreed to work together and that means sharing each other's stuff, liking their posts, helping each other brand and market, that you could take that back. And that, you know, we could all start to earn money if we all believed in helping one another. And I don't believe in pay to play. I think that's corrupt. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but I won't. So I'm not gonna, uh, it's just <laughs> corrupt. Yes, like you're, there should be no reason why anybody says that in order to market and brand yourself, you have to pay. That makes no sense. It, it is, uh, you know, I don't know. It's like corporate bullies. Stop giving all of your stuff away. And that goes as far as to say as well, everybody who's paying a distributor, DistroKid, CD Baby, um, TuneCore, Orchard Music, whatever it is, you're paying that person to distribute, which means you lose your rights and your royalties for that, whatever you gave them. You're only going to see such a small return. And we have to stop believing that we need those platforms in order to be successful because the bands that we all liked didn't have that. They didn't have that. The internet didn't even exist and yet almost everyone in the world can tell you who the specials, the toasters, um, fear, you know, those are people who are in the streets doing that sort of thing. And I feel like because the internet has become such a nice commodity that we have devalued a lot of things because it's easy and it's convenient and I can go in search of this without really seeing, you know, all of the other um, sort of ramifications that come along with being uh, used to convenience. If you're in a band, don't be lazy. It's work. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> no, I was actually going to uh, dive into that a little bit further because uh, last week we, we asked uh, our guests about like the whole Spotify thing and how the ceo was saying like artists need to make more in order to get heard or get better pay um i was going to ask what would you recommend or what do you recommend artists do that's an alternative to like the the need or the the perceived need to get on a spotify playlist in order to get their music heard by a bunch of people well a lot of people are recording their friends are recording them. They're using somebody to mix and master them. Instead of saying, I'm going to send all these tracks now to DistroKid, CD Baby, blah, 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 so that I can get on these other platforms, do it yourself. Is it work? Yep. But you can take all of those files and put them up on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all of yourself. You can also then submit them to Pandora, if you like, without a distributor, all of yourself. SoundCloud. SoundCloud, Bandcamp, all of that's free. Is it extra work? Are there multiple steps? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, but we've come across bands that aren't, they use Bandcamp solely as their main thing and they're successful as just a band by doing that. 
Um, we have, there's like, who is that? Um, Umbrella Corporation, they're from Minnesota, oh, uh, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Our kids like them. Yeah. That's great, right? Yeah, We're super good. One. But they don't use anybody. Um, Petra showed us them. Coneheads, another good band from Indiana. They have mixtapes and they are only known online because their friends videoed them in a garage. Um, so the underground people who really believe in being true anarchists against capitalism are doing it already and they're becoming known. Use zines, use local radio stations, reach out to college radio, reach out to people who do podcasts. There's so many different ways that you can do it without having to sell your soul and pay somebody to distribute your stuff. And plus, if you have those audio files, go to say, I don't know, Target or wherever and buy your CDs and make your CDs. Yeah. I have a quick, uh, I, yeah, sorry, Dan, yeah. can I, <laughs> I have a quick question. All you. I totally agree with with this mindset and mentality and Bandcamp is something that we always try to push yes. for all the freaking time. Um, but one thing we run across, one thing we run into troubles with a little bit is the audience itself sometimes. Like, do you guys have any, have you had any luck or successful conversations with people who are just kind of like, oh, you know, well, if they're not on Spotify, I, I don't want to listen to them because I don't know what Bandcamp is. And they're, they're kind of like closed minded to trying out new things because we run into those people a lot sometimes. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. Huh. Not really that, but, uh, you know, there are those people that don't want a physical copy of something but there are people that still do. And not, not that, you know, I'm not gonna check that van down because they're not on Spotify or anything like that. I don't think we've come across that. I think our hardest sell or what we find is the band's mentality that they feel they have to pay a platform or a distributor. We've had a few actually listen to us um, and take our advice and like, oh, this is a lot of work. Yeah, it is a lot of work. Um, I didn't say it was going to be easy, <laughs> but I did say that you're going to reap all of the benefit from that. Um, because if you can make your own CDs and put them on Bandcamp, does Bandcamp take a small percentage? It does as a, as a processing fee. Um, not that I can say I totally agree with that either, but you don't you lose the right and royalty to that music. So if you take it down, um, you still own it and you can then re-release it if you like, unlike say using um, distro kids, CD baby, blah, blah, blah. Because if they, uh, if you say take that down and they don't take it down, they don't have to because you paid them right. to distribute it. So it's theirs. Um, but what about fighting that mentality in the listenership is what I'm, we're kind of asking. Uh, Not necessarily the bands, but like people who listen to the bands then. Because that's our biggest problem is fighting that mentality in, in just regular audience members. Right. Sometimes. And that might be just a mentality that we're coming across here in our area because it does seem like a not a lazy audience but maybe like a little bit more of a just used to a, like the they're used to the ease of, yeah, of the ease. like they use spotify that's really all they use they don't bother with any other apps so if you're not at the most easiest convenience of them you know check search on spotify oh you don't show up then that's the end of the road for them they don't bother with it anymore I have to say that we had like our listeners haven't, I've never heard that from anybody. Um, but I don't know. I find it interesting. Like who wants to listen to me talk and yell at people every week about the same <laughs> on Facebook. I think that our audience, our, our audience members though are older too. Um, our average listenership is between the age of 35 and 55. So younger people, I think, sorry, they're lazy. And the kids that are in high school, middle school, they're using these apps that are quick, easy, convenient, like the whole bully on search thing and learning how to research something. Psh, we don't even teach that in school. It's horrible. And that's another soapbox issue, but they want that quick. I touched it. I saw it. Oh, here it goes. So um, I don't know how you make younger people care because they've grown up with not caring and having instant gratification. Um, it's not a lot it's of- It's just a battle we have to keep fighting essentially, right? I think maybe is. I think, 
you kind of trick them into knowing other stuff. So you don't know what you don't know. But if you start, um, say your listenership is in the, the 20s and they're like, oh, all I know is that. Do a Zoom where you show them how to use a different platform and explain who else is on those things. Because now I'm sitting here and I'm staring at you going, oh yeah, duh, maybe I should do that too. Because I mean, it's the next TikTok, it's the next Snapchat, it's the next whatever the fuck we want it to be. And as long as we teach somebody how to use it and show them, it's like leading that horse to water, you will eventually get it to drink because after seeing that water so many times, it'll click that maybe I should check something else out there. Bands also though can help with combat this if they also believe in those other platforms, know about those platforms and the benefits to them. Yeah. Wisdom. Mike Trump. Wisdom. <laughs> All right, dudes, we're getting close to the end of our time here with you because we're going to have to transition soon to another band. But before we go, can you plug everywhere that people can find just the Scott Kid information as well as perhaps ways they can contact you if we have any bands listening to the show who are like, wow, I want to check y'all out. So you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, SoundCloud, Bandcamp. Spotify. I know, right? Ugh. But what we've done is all those bands that are on, we've made playlists for each year. So you can go and see everybody and listen to everyone in one playlist. Shh, it's bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> we have a few months to add. We'll say months. We got some work to do. But um, we moved. Whatever. All of those, just the Scott Kid. My name is everything. If you just Google us, bam, we have a website. It'll show up everywhere. That's the important thing too, metadata. Everything is everything. Like it's the same thing. So if you search Just the Sky Kid on Facebook, it'll also lead you to anywhere else you might want to find us. Our predominant platform, I would say, is the Facebook page. So if you go there and you shoot us a message, I will respond to you. Um, I try to respond when they come in, but there are days where I'm like, I'll try to do just, just on Tuesday and Thursday. But people can catch our show Tuesday and Thursday. So, and we have dates if anyone is listening and interested. Um, August 20th, which is this next Thursday, if you're like, ah, oh, but get on that. It's easy to do, but we can make that work. Uh, and then September, um, what is that? The first three weeks. <laughs> right? Get a calendar. September 3rd, 10th, and 17th. Nope, I lie. 10, 17, 24. There you go. There you go. So mm -hmm. if anyone is listening and wants on, um, we have open availability. All of that information is tagged or pinned at the top of our Facebook page as well. Fantastic. Thank you yes, so, thank much. so much. This was awesome. Awesome wonderful enlightening and i really hope that our bands because we do have a lot of listenership sets so other bands i hope our bands listening in take note of your wisdom and advice um it was really really fun thank you guys for for tuning in and uh hopefully you know best of luck with everything you have going on in the future and hope you get to do some live shows as soon as this whole covid thing is is finally over right thank you for having us this was fun Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? I said it was odd sitting on this side of the fence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was it was wonderful. So thank you so much. Yes. And for those of you scrolling through Facebook, don't go away. We'll be right back with Elysian Green, a fusion band for the night. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye. Oh, how Come on, listen to dance. She got her show.